I'm pr absolutely privileged to be kicking off uh, the next two days worth of presentations, particularly because I can just do my thing and then sit down and relax afterwards and enjoy everyone else's. Um, f fat and fasting. Fasting is, is something that's been around for ever, pretty much. Um, in fact, I came across a book last week from the 80s and it talks about the fact that intentional fasting um, is cited in the Bible 78 times. So interesting. But, um, you know, it, it's been around forever, yet when you look at the research, um, we've got a, we haven't got um, a, a wealth of research to inform us. We've got a good starting body um, of, of literature, particularly in, um, in, in rats and mice. There's a, there's a small body of research in humans. And, um, and I'm going to communicate some of the research to you. I have been doing um, fasting with my clients in clinical practice. I'm a, I'm a practicing dietitian um, and I've been doing low carb for the last five or six years and have only kind of incorporated intermittent fasting into my practice the last year or so. So uh, for those of you who, who know and love what the fat as much as myself and my co-authors uh, Grant Schofield and Craig Roger do, um, we do have another book coming out. Um, it's, it's timely and, um, and there are no prizes for guessing what the name of it is called. What the fast. <laughs> so, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a sneak preview as to the, the method that we've come up with that we think um, is going to help a lot of people with a, a lot of their, their, their issues and, and ailments. Um, but before I want to talk, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the benefits and the science around fasting. And really, in a nutshell, it's about... Um, it's about creating optimal health, finding optimal health. That's, that's why we're all here. We all want to uh, subscribe to the live long, drop dead philosophy. We want to live to the ripe old age of 90s or, or beyond, um, but we want to live well. Um, and then we want to just die in our sleep. I mean, that's the <laughs> ultimate goal. Or I'd be happy to get knocked off my mountain bike when I'm 98 in the forest. That would be, that would be excellent. I'd die happy. Um, so to achieve optimal health, it's about creating a balance between um, living in a state of anabolism and catabolism. And what I mean by that is um, an anabolic state or anabolism is, is where, we, where we have growth and development. So typically when you feed the cells, when you eat. Um, and catabolism is where we break down. So we have to be able to uh, break down things before we can build up new things. Uh, so, so fasting um, is, is quite good because, of course, um, our, our typical, uh, typical day um, is guided by our, uh, as our, guided by our Ministry of Health um, and wider guidelines, suggests that we need to eat every two or three hours. So we're constantly in that anabolic state. We're constantly feeding ourselves. And I have to say, thank goodness for Mother Nature, who has, um, who, who definitely has our backs and has has placed sleep as a non-negotiable. So at least we are getting a period of time where we are in in a catabolic state. But unfortunately, we have busy lives, and we all love our phones, and we all get up early and, and do things. So our period of sleep is getting shorter and shorter. So again, we want to um, we want to extend the period that we are in a catabolic state, so that we can uh, build and, and regrow. Right, so on to fasting. So I, you know, there, there are so many benefits to fasting and there's so many different ways and there's no one established protocol. So I want to, I want to summarize fasting benefits and in science in, into six key points. The first one is weight loss and I think weight loss you know, it always deserves a category on its own because um, so many people are trying to achieve um, a, a healthy weight for themselves. And I think we've been very unsuccessful in the past in, um, in, in achieving and obtaining weight loss maintenance. You can jump up and down and lose weight loss. It's, it's kind of easy. But keeping it off long term is not so easy. And our current way of guiding people, which is really all about persistent daily calorie restriction doesn't work long term. So typically, 
you know, if, if you want to lose weight, you reduce your calories by about five, six hundred, um, and you, you, know, you, you establish that calorie deficit and you lose weight. Um, but we know that doesn't work long term for various reasons. And one of the reasons why we believe it doesn't work long term is that it creates hormonal havoc. So it, it, it causes changes in our hunger fullness hormones, our leptin and our ghrelin. And eventually, we get to a point where we just get too hungry and, and we can't really maintain the hours and hours of, of energy out exercise to, um, to obtain that, that lower weight, that we just get hungry and start eating and we tend to pile on more weight than we did before. So fasting um, can potentially come into its own here um, simply by keeping the body guessing. And... Um, what I mean by that is that on some days um, you might have very low calories or even no calories and on other days you might have higher calories than you would otherwise have if you were restricting. So the body doesn't see that as a massive threat and it doesn't adjust its hormonal milieu to try and um, establish the weight um, at a certain point so that it, um, so, so that it, it doesn't actually get into any strife. So fasting can be very helpful for that. I use fasting um, for weight loss for two types of people. People who have a lot of weight to lose um, and for people who have very small amount of weight to lose and particularly for people who are stuck in that LCHF space. They're doing everything right and they're not moving and fasting can be an incredible tool to help just get that one, two or three Ks off and keep it off. Of course, it's got to be sustainable. Glycemic control um, and, and, other, um, and other conditions. So, so fasting is just really an extension of LCHF or the ketogenic diet, which of course is just the extreme end of LCHF. And um, it helps to improve insulin sensitivity. Um, one of our biggest problems we have is hyperinsulinemia. Um, it's a great hangman word for those people who play online hangman. Um, and it's a term that is not, um, it's not really on the map as much as it should be. And it's one of the biggest problems um, that we have. It's chronically elevated levels of insulin. And that often goes undiagnosed because we can have very high levels of insulin um, while we still have normal glucose control. So you are seemingly normal, but you've got high levels of insulin circulating. And when you've got high levels of insulin circulating, you can't burn fat, it switches off fat burning, and it also is toxic to almost every system in the body. So fasting can help there. Inflammation, again, fasting as an extension of LCHF. Studies have shown that there have been reductions in some of the inflammatory markers, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, and CRP. Again, um, you know, um, Steve Finney and Jeff Volek have done some fabulous work on LCHF and looking at inflammatory markers. And again, uh, Walter Longo is the guy that we can in attribute a lot of this fasting research um, to, and he's really extending this into some fabulous areas. Very exciting. The immune system is also... Um, well influenced by fasting and we know that fasting has the potential to um, help st uh, stem cell regeneration and that has a potential for, um, it has huge potential for the management of immune conditions, um, autoimmune conditions and also um, periods of time where you have treatment that damages the immune system such as cancer. So um, Dawn's going to talk um, a lot more about you know, how keto and fasting can influence um, cancer therapy and, um, and issues around it. Then we have the brain um, and of course we know that when you get into ketosis you produce uh, ketones, you, you get into nutritional ketosis and that um, you know, evidence is showing us that ketones are very neuroprotective. Um, and there's some good starting research showing um, that there is a protective effect of circulating ketones with neurological conditions like dementia and Alzheimer's, um, and also brain cancer is another one. So a very, very exciting area there. Like I said, the science, the actual studies, um, they don't exist in a form that we can say this is, this is definitely the case, but the proof of concept and, um, and the potential is definitely there and exciting. 
oh sorry, BDNF is brain derived neurotropic factor. It's, it's basically the brain fertilizer. Um, and what fasting does is it helps produce more BDNF. Um, another thing that helps produce BDNF is exercise. So remember, we can't forget about all our other important aspects of life and lifestyle. It's all one big holistic package. Um, and then the most intriguing um, of them all, I think, is this, is this cell repair. Um, these, these buzzwords, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and autophagies, where, where the cells actually consume themselves, really, the old use-by date cells actually um, consume themselves and produce energy to use for other things. And a classic example um, to relate this to is, is think about your, your fridge at home. And if you had uh, food in your fridge that had passed its use-by date, like old yogurt or you know, cream that you know, just starts smelling a little bit nasty. If you left those things in your fridge and just purchased more and filled up your fridge, after a while, your fridge would not look or smell so good or be that healthy. Um, and it's a little bit like the cells. If you don't get rid of the old, um, you can't build up the new. And autophagy um, seems, to, seems to do that. Um, it helps clean up the cells so you can start afresh. And it's no wonder that the Nobel Peace Prize last year was in uh, physio physiology and medicine was awarded to a Japanese uh, researcher um, about his work in establishing the mechanisms behind autophagy. So I guess, you know, how does this work in practice? I guess this side of, of your, you know, on your right-hand side, um, these benefits um, are really about managing existing conditions. And I think to, to help manage that, you could do uh, fasting int intermittently and frequently. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. On the other side, you know, to try and achieve some of these um, benefits, it's more about the longer term fasting. We don't know the exact number. You know, people say to me, you know, what time frame does autophagy start? Well, the research, you know, it, it's not there yet, but um, we come across around a 24 hour time period. So, you know, anything 24 hours or beyond. I think it's, it's, it, the more you fast, the more you get the benefits from autophagy. And the, the science has got to catch up there for sure. Um, and of course, there's overlap. Right, so what happens when you fast? Um, this is what people think happens. It's a very negative, um, it's a very negative thing. People think fasting, oh, deprivation, I'm, I'm gonna be hungry, I'm gonna be walking around in a state of um, tiredness and my energy levels are gonna drop. And you, you hear that all the time. And in fact, um, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and y people who fast regularly, but fast well, and that's really important, um, they feel, they feel amazing. It can, it can really enhance how you feel. So here we've got a graph from a, a group of people who have studied over 84 hours. And I just want to go through some of the physiology. Here you've got at the top ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone. And you can see that ghrelin pulses. So you get hunger in the form of little waves. Um, and for those of you who are already on LCHF, which is probably 99% of you, if not 100, you will know that missing a meal when you are really fat adapted is not a drama at all. You probably are all intermittent fasting. If you missed breakfast this morning, you're intermittent fasting. Um, and you know, when hunger comes, it comes and it stays for 10 minutes and you, you don't actually get what I call hang, what we, what we all call hangry. When you are addicted to carbs and you missed a meal, you kind of just climbing the walls. Um, and, and that doesn't tend to happen when you're fat adapted and you get into some fasting. Of course, ghrelin um, goes down over time. So, um, so we, again, you think you know, day two, day three, you're going to feel a lot hungrier, and actually that, that is not what happens. Um, cortisol hormone, which is your stress hormone, that does go up. So um, it's, it, acute stress is actually important for the body. Um, you might have heard of hormesis. Uh, where you get an acute stress that's good for you, chronic stress, no good. So for those people who are, um, you know, those, those people, those highly stressed people, I'm sure there's no one here, <laughs> that, um, you know, your type A personality, highly anxious people, and you need to be honest to recognize that about yourself. Um, if that's you, long-term fasting might not be for you because it can, can actually make things worse. 
Um, growth hormone is, uh, is pulses as well, and growth hormone is secreted, and that's really important because what it does is, along with um, um, a higher protein intake when you do eat, and along with exercise, it helps to preserve muscle mass, and that's really important. Um, I just thought I'd throw my... Um, I, did, I did a three-day fast uh, just over a month ago, and uh, it was my first one, actually. It was, it was fascinating. If you want the whole story, you can read it on my Facebook page because I don't have time to, to go through the psychology of it. But um, I, I tracked my ketones, and I just wanted to show you that, you know, started off um, under the threshold of nutritional ketosis, which is said to be 0.5 millimoles per liter. Um, and you can see it tracked up to 72 hours where I finished at just over 4. So again, it gets you to that level of ketosis and um, that is the place where a lot of people, and I'm not saying all people, a lot of people experience that, that immense clarity and that immense productivity. And like I said, it doesn't happen to everyone and it's not for everyone, but um, a lot of people get a lot of benefit. Right, onto super fasting. Super fasting is, is the term that we've coined for our what the fast. And, um, you know, we've taken what's out there in terms of the 5-2 and the 16-8 and the warrior diet. And we have, you know, looked at the pros and cons and come up with our own system that we think will work. Um, and it's a, it, it's a combination between fasting and fasting mimicking, which is the LCHF way of eating. And we believe that it is a potent synergy that works with your biology and not against it. It also works with your psychology and your lifestyle. And I'll show you how it does that. Uh, rule number one, you'll know, people who, who know what the fat know that we love our 10 rules. Um, we have 10 rules of fasting, but I'm summarizing it into seven for today. First one, be a fat burner. If you are a carb addict um, and you are a high carb eater, you can fast tomorrow, but it's gonna hurt. <laughs> so getting fat adapted first just allows the whole process to be a bit more pleasant and a bit more easy. And of course, the more pleasant and easy it is, the more likely you will do it long term to get the benefits. So eat LCHF um, to, get, to get you set up. Rule number two, simply get super fasting. Fast on Mondays and on Tuesdays. Fasting on Monday and Tuesday uh, will, will kick you off on our super fasting method. And we've designed it that it works with with your own biology, and your own biology tells you when you look at the um, you look at the waves of hunger based on circadian rhythms, on normal uh, biological uh, rhythms, we are most hungry at night and least hungry in the morning. So let's actually do something that works with your biology. And of course, at night you might be cooking and preparing meals for your family. Um, so engage with them in a meal just to make it work with your lifestyle. Um, we, again, there are no rules whether you should have water, tea, coffee, bone broth, there, there are no rules. Um, it, it's finding your own way and, how, and what we've come up with is that um, definitely have water, you need to be well hydrated. We do allow, whatever that means, tea and coffee with a splash of milk. Um, and the jury's out on coffee, but we really want to um, get people to do this. Um, so we, sac we might sacrifice best practice to, to get some practice. We'd rather people actually do this um, with their coffee than not do any fasting because they don't want to give up their coffee. And there are lots of people who don't want to give up their coffee. <laughs> Rule number three, eat super meals for, um, for dinner on Monday and Tuesday. Um, and this is one of Craig's dishes. Um, it's a salmon poke bowl underneath the the salmon marinated in Asian flavors. Uh, we've got cauliflower and bro broccoli rice underneath there. And um, these weird things here are just um, crunchy nori sheets, which are um, loaded with iodine. So, uh, you know, a meal that's packed with, nutrient, uh, packed with nutrients and micronutrients. We are all about nutrient density when you eat to make up for the lack of nutrient density when you're not eating. Um, rule number four, don't overeat. And that is, that's, that's massive, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, just enjoy your food. What we don't want to do with encouraging fasting is get people into you know, bad behaviors. And um, while you might not, you're unlikely to make up the calories that you've missed from fasting during your 24 hours, 
Um, if you are overeating, that's ju it's just not good behavior, um, and you end up developing a poor relationship with food. And, and actually, we want to create the exact opposite. We want you, we want to, we want you to create a good relationship, a healthy relationship with food. Um, this this quote that I came across is is quite interesting. A diet changes the way you look. A fast changes the way you see. And what fasting does is it really forces you to examine your relationship with food. And it's just a fascinating experience. For people who choose not to fast or don't want to fast, um, just try it once and see the psychological um, things that happen. It's just a fascinating experience. Rule number five, eat LCHF from Wednesday to Sunday. So what we want to do with the super fasting system is to create um, a level of a uh, higher level clarity and, and building up ketones on Monday, Tuesday. So you can have a productive Monday, Tuesday. You can go to work and, and tackle it head on. And then the rest of the week, you are eating in a way that is fasting mimicking. So you might still have a higher level of circulating ketones that drops off towards the end of the week. So we want to carry the benefits on. Rule number six, the rules are there to be broken rule. Um, this is one of my... This is one of my mantras. I, I know there are lots of zealots out there um, that don't even want to, you know, look at a carrot um, because it's got too much starch in it. Um, only five grams, really. Um, but, but I think to make this sustainable long term, whether it's LCHF or whether it's fasting or hopefully a combination of, of them both, you need, to, you need to be able to work with your, you know, your your situation and you don't want to be that person or that couple that doesn't get invited anywhere because you can't eat anything. <laughs> so um, the, let me get this straight, it's not a license to, to go crazy, it's not a cheat day, it's not a license to overeat, but it's a license to go, you know what, on the weekend I've gone, gone out with some friends and they've ordered pizza, I'm going to have some pizza. And most importantly, I'm not going to beat myself up about it, I'm not going to feel guilty, I'm really going to enjoy it because it's part of the plan. It's not off the plan, it's part of the plan. And then, you know, get back into Sunday and Monday. Um, what you need to be aware of is that you're eating um, slightly left of what you, what you normally eat, um, that it doesn't derail you. There are certain people that have a little bit of chocolate and then bang, they're, they're back into carb addiction. So you, you've, got to, you've got to watch that. You've really got to work out how this works for you. And you're the only person that can know that. Be flexible. If you're thinking Monday, Tuesday, that's when I'm you know, spending my time working around food. Don't do it on Monday, Tuesday. Do it on Wednesday and Thursday. It's fine. Like This is a rule, but it's not a rule. It's for you to take what you want to take from it. You might find that a 24 hour on Monday and a 24 hour on Tuesday is too much, but just try a 24 hour on Monday. The method that we have come up with, we, we, want, we want people to actually give it a good go for a month. So Monday, Tuesday fasting for each week for a month and then assess how they go. And then they might carry on going Monday, Tuesday at the start of each month after that, or they might go, this is awesome, I'm gonna carry on. It's, it's very much a, a navigated process. This is an example of one week super fasting um, from yours truly. Um, and Monday, Tuesday, clearly there's nothing apart from a super meal. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, low carb stuff in, in general, you guys would be familiar with this. Um, Saturday, I, I was really busy during the day, so I just had, um, you know, milky coffee and some biltong, my favorite stuff in the whole world. Um, which, you know, it kept me reasonably full for the rest of the day. Um, and then, of course, Saturday night, I sort of broke out a little bit and probably ate too much chocolate. Um, so, you know, so that's how it goes. Sunday, back into it, um, and then getting back into it on Monday. And here at the bottom are my ketones. So what, what really fascinated me was that even after 24 hours of fasting, I was already on 0.7, which is the first dot there. Um, and what fascinated me even more is that on day two in the evening, I was... Um, I was up there, 2.2. My ketones were 2.2, um, which is indicating a deep level of ketosis. And I'd had dinner the night before. So you can see the fasting mimicking effect um, of, of eating low carb. 
And then on, um, not, not sure why I, I popped up over 0.5 on Thursday evening, but again, this is where the individual variation comes into it. We also don't know uh, um, a lot about how exercise influences ketones. But this is what it can look like. And my, and my colleague, Professor Grant Schofield, did the same, and his really mimics mine as well. So that's really the picture that, um, that we've both got. Okay. So, um, to finish off, top three takeaways, but I, I do want to just say, I just want to say one thing. Intermittent fasting is a bit of a no-brainer. It's kind of easy and there's not a lot that, um, that can go wrong. Of course, there's a whole group of people that shouldn't be doing fasting and we, we won't talk about that um, right now. But longer fasting, we don't really know a lot about the effects of it. Um, so, it's not something to take on lightly at all. Um, and I just, I just wanted to say that, um, just to make sure that no one goes out for the next seven days and doesn't eat and then something happens and blames me. Um, so top three fasting takeaway points. The first one is start low and go slow. If you've never fasted before, just miss a meal. If you've only ever missed a meal, miss two meals. Um, and then you can progress into something which is a little bit sort of bigger, bigger and better. Number two, I know it sounds cliched, but it's so true. Know your why. Why are you fasting? Um, if you're doing it for weight loss, you should be achieving weight loss. If you're doing a longer fast for health and longevity and aging and, and, and anti-aging, when you get to day two and it's feeling a little bit psychologically hard, go back to why you're doing this. I'm doing this to prolong my life and to live according to the live long drop dead philosophy. And once you know that, it will give you what you need to carry on and kind of be, be strong-willed and strong-minded about it. You only need to be strong-minded psychologically because you're not hungry. Um, and the last one is don't overthink it. Um, I think we spend too much time thinking about food, and when you think about food, you tend to want it. So really take your thoughts away from food and keep busy, and that's a way that, that, it, will, um, that, that it will work for you. I should have said top four fasting points because I'm actually going to just add a fourth one now, which is to pay attention. You need to pay attention. And what do I mean by that? Pay attention to, um, to how you feel. If you don't feel good, it might not be for you. You need to pay attention to how you feel. You need to pay attention to whether your weight is going down, if that's what you, you need it, or you're doing it for. You need to pay attention to your blood sugar, to your ketones, to your HbA1c, to your markers. Um, and you will soon work out whether this is working for you or not. So, so please avoid any kind of unsafe practices. Um, take these top three fasting points and, and wait for the research to guide us even further so that we can you know, navigate and, and perfect the system. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and it was a pleasure to talk to you this morning.